Welcome to uh, another edition of Grant Thornton's Leaders Lounge, where we talk with some of the most successful and recognisable leaders in Ireland about their journey to leadership, uh, the lessons learned and their plans and hopes uh, for the future. Today I have the great pleasure uh, of welcoming the Minister of Finance, Mr Pascal Dunhu. Welcome Minister. Good morning Michael, how are you? I'm very well, thank you very much. Let's go right back to the start, St Declan's College, uh, CBS in Cabra. Um, what kind of student were you? Uh, I was a hard-working student, first and foremost. Uh, uh, I uh, really, really had the uh, kind of life-changing experience of having a few teachers uh, that, in retrospect, had uh, such an effect and influence on the journey of my life. I had a um, wonderful English teacher who uh, really imbued into me a, an appreciation of reading and the value of words. And then I had a, a fantastic business and economics teacher. Uh, and uh, he played a really big role in what I ended up doing and what you and I are talking about in my life as a politician and as Minister for Finance. So, so it was as direct as that, two teachers that, that had taken both an interest in you and I suppose you, you had an interest in their subjects has shaped your career? Very much so. I mean, St. Declan's was a essential part in my journey in life. It was and is an excellent school uh, that valued hard work and that valued the development of kind of the rounded character of its students and it still does that. Uh, and I will be forever grateful to them uh, and to the school for the gift they gave me of the kind of education uh, that I received at a really important point in my life. And there were a couple of teachers who I can directly trace uh, their teaching of me to what I'm doing now. Now, whether they would think that is a good thing or not is a matter for another debate, uh, but it mattered to me. Excellent. And then when did college come on the radar? So in the sense, was that something that you kind of aspire to quite often? I know you got a scholarship. So it was, a, was it something that was planned or did it naturally just as, you know, as your love for those two subjects come along that it, it became something that you kind of you fell into it or did you, did you just set out strategically to obtain that college degree? No, I didn't have any strategic goals at that point in life uh, and it really came from the enjoyment and appreciation that I had of a few subjects uh, at second level uh, and a kind of a unformed sense that they could open up new worlds and new possibilities to me and the very last thing I did in, in ending up studying politics and economics uh, was have some kind of a master plan laid down at a young age that I was going to end up in politics. I just followed what I enjoyed. And the kind of, the, the choice that I had at that point is whether I would go down the kind of arts route um, because uh, I loved reading, uh, adore books, and I had the path where I go down English and philosophy was option number one. Or option number two, would I pursue the other great interest that I had at that point, which was economics and the relationship between economics and politics and political choices. Um, I decided to do the latter, uh, but I very much hope at some point later in life that I can go back and do the former. Very good. You had a part-time job at the time, um, I think helping your dad putting up marquees and, and around the country. How important do you think it is um, having part-time work at a young age to kind of, as you're doing your education part? I think it's so important. And I spent uh, all of my uh, student life in second level uh, uh, helping my dad in his marquee business. Uh, so I put marquees up uh, with dad all over Dublin and uh, across different parts of Ireland. Uh, if there was, uh, if anybody's looking at this and they're thinking of a wedding, a, uh, a party or something they had in their home or their garden that involved a tent. Uh, there's more than a small chance that during the 1990s that uh, I was uh, put up the tent. Uh, and uh, when I got into college then, I did a number of internships then with Procter & Gamble, uh, the consumer goods company who I ultimately worked for for nearly 10 years. And when I think about what education looks like, uh, as vital as <clears throat> the academic aspect of it is, um, like not too far behind is the broader human education that you get in the jobs that you do, mm. um, which for me went from putting up marquees to uh, doing internships with a, a large employer. Uh, and uh, whenever I meet young students at different stages of their life, I always say to them, get out and do those kind of things. And I know really big employers like you um, play a, a really important role, both formally and informally, in helping transition year students, helping students Absolutely. that are in, in, in college, come into your office, 
come into your company for a few days. And that both formal and also sometimes informal mm -hmm. stuff has a huge effect on the choices that young students can make later in life. So the internship, the relationship with Procter Gamble started during college on, at an internship. Is that what led then to the position you obtained? In the yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I uh, got to that point of where uh, I was uh, approaching summers, thinking, what am I going to do? Uh, and I spent a summer or two working with Dad and helping him. Uh, and then got to that point where I said, well, am I going to go down the J1 route and head off to America with my pals? And just as I was beginning to think about doing this, I saw a poster uh, in college about uh, going to work over in London or Newcastle uh, for Procter & Gamble. I didn't know anything about Dad's washing up powder, uh, Pringles, Sunny Delight, Pantene or Pampers. Uh, but I went and did an internship with that company first in Newcastle okay. and then in London the following year and had an absolute ball. Uh, I had a wonderful time doing it and they ultimately end, ended up going to work with them for nearly 10 years. So maybe start talking about, so you enter then Procter & Gamble, I believe you are on the, the sales side. Yep. And, and the, so what, what are the skills or that you think that you needed? On the, were you a naturally a salesperson? Was it something you had to learn? I had to learn it. And I had, again, a vague sense as I was finishing up in college that this could be uh, the next part of my development. I didn't have a plan at that point of wanting to become a you know, big figure in, you know, or, or, or or even a, any kind of a figure in corporate life or you know, have a long commercial career or anything. But I did have a sense that there were a, a, quite a few companies that were really capable of delivering you a very broad-based commercial experience that would be a real help later on in life. And just as you know, big companies like your, your own uh, will have lots of graduates that come in, not all of whom ultimately end up being in your company or similar companies for all their careers. They mm -hmm. might go and work for clients or go to different parts of our economy. It was the same thing with Procter & Gamble. It was along with companies like Mars, like Unilever and some of the banks, was a, a company that if you started off your career with them, could give you a really broad-based set of skills and development. Of course, their secret is to get you in thinking you're only going to be with them for a few years and 30 years later you're still there. That's what they do. Uh, and uh, I started off in the sales function and for the first couple of years with Procter & Gamble I had a Vauxhall Cavalier, a boot full of fairy washing up liquid and Pampers and I, I, I sold um, you know, truckloads of those products to independent cash and carries for around a year and it was a brilliant experience because I went from living here in Dublin, a uh, very Irish existence, studying hard to a couple of months later, I was trying to sell uh, washing up powder to a uh, owner of a very large cash and carry in East London. And that real appreciation of hard commercial decisions uh, and the enjoyment from all of that ultimately led to me with being P&G for 10 years. And in that 10 year period, you moved from the sales area into being a commercial director. Again, was that something that you kind of aspired to as you were going along? Was it an opportune moment that you, that, that promotion, was that part of the career path or? Yeah, I suppose as I worked through the early part of my career, uh, you then did begin to think about uh, a career path. Uh, for me, what it always is about doing as well as you can with what, the role that you're in, the office that you hold, the job that you do. Uh, I think there is, intrinsic and really kind of deep value in return in trying to really do your best with where you are in each phase in your career or your life. And that's the way I've always approached roles in public life or in private life. Uh, but after a few years into Procter & Gamble, I did get a real sense of the opportunities that they would offer as such a large employer. And after a few years in, I said, yeah, this is for me. Uh, and I really enjoyed it, really enjoyed the cut and trust of commercial life. So you must have then had to, to move from being, I suppose, not saying, uh, on your own, on the road, selling and, and, and doing that into being a commercial director. You probably had a team underneath yeah, you. Yeah, no, I had very, uh, uh, the, the scale of the organisation that I was responsible for kind of grew and grew. And at the end, it started off as being, it started off as a solitary enough role, mm. being responsible for myself, my targets, my sales area, my physical sales area. 
but as my career went on, you know, I, I, I managed, I either managed or engaged with virtually every retailer in the United Kingdom. Um, was responsible for large parts of our business with very large retailers, large customers in the UK, then moved into a marketing role. And then when I ended up uh, looking after the sales and marketing team uh, here in Ireland, and at other points before then, my main role was to manage an organisation and the people who reported into me. And did you find that an easy transition to go from that role or was that something that you kind of, not saying initially struggled, but you had to learn and pivot and... That's the huge benefit of an employer like Procter & Gamble, if they think you've the potential to do it and you deliver versus their expectations, they then deliver a career plan and path that delivers that development for you. Uh, you have to want it, you have to be willing to work hard at it, but they provide the opportunities. So at each stage in my career, with each job I took, uh, my organisational responsibilities would have grew. So when you get to the point that you're managing a, a, a team of people and then a larger team of people, each role before that equips you for being able to do it. And well, how would you describe your leadership style then running that team? Was it one of consultation, um, pulling people together, um, setting out a strategy. How, how would you have kind of managed the day-to-day -day from running a team? What would your style kind of be? Uh, be really clear on your goal. Be really clear in communicating directly to those who you work for, uh, who work for you, what you need, what you expect, and then enable them to deliver those targets uh, and uh, motivate them, support them. Uh, uh, to deliver very clearly defined targets. Uh, so in a commercial role like that, it for me was about clarity regard around objective and then uh, support to deliver those objectives in the right areas and then creating an atmosphere in which you could uh, be very transparent and clear regarding where you stand versus delivering those objectives. Fundamentally, and I think the pandemic has demonstrated this to us on a society-wide level, uh, but it's certainly demonstrated to employers all of this, uh, the need to be aware of the broader context within which uh, people are working. Uh, and that's certainly something that I was very much aware of with the teams that I managed. So that's uh, 10 years Procter Gamble. Did you return to Ireland in 2013 with Procter Gamble or was that uh, kind of another phase in your career? I came back with Procter and Gamble, uh, wanted to at some point come back home to Ireland, I did. And then uh, as I came back home, I began to develop these thoughts about will I run away and join the circus, uh, which I did. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, that's led to where I am now. That must have been a hard decision. I mean, you came back, you met your wife in, in, in the UK, mm -hmm. so you came back. Um, moving from a stable payment career path where you can very clearly set out how far you wish to go with, with a bit of look into the uh, trust uh, of, of, of politics and the uncertainty of politics where you put yourself forward and you get re-elected or not as the case yep. may be. How, how did you kind of cross that we were kind of in your, in, in, in your mind? Uh, because just to go back to uh, the way we talked about when you're responsible for people and you're leading them and you have responsibility to deliver particular objectives and priorities. It became really clear to me as I moved through uh, that part of my career uh, that I had other priorities for my life overall. And at that point and now, it was about public service, uh, uh, which really, really matters, uh, mattered to me. But also the fact that I really enjoy politics. I get a lot of reward from it, a lot of... Uh, uh, real every day the challenge the cut and trust of us is something that fundamentally i i enjoy uh, i won't pretend i enjoy it all of the time uh, because there are moments in which you are really really tested and to contend to you or to your viewers that every single moment in politics is a joy-filled experience i don't think anybody would believe me but even for those moments that are not enjoyable uh, they are full of making choices and they are full of meaning and they're full of being tested and uh, intrinsically that's what I really enjoy. The challenge, really. Yeah. You're always having a new goal to kind yeah. of try and, interesting. And then you got elected um, <clears throat> back in I think what, it was about 2015 or so? Yeah, I mean the early part of my career was a pretty uh, visceral demonstration of the tests that I just referred to there. 
uh, because I was successful in getting elected uh, in my first local election, uh, uh, though that was a, a tough enough contest. Uh, then stood in the general election of 2007, didn't get elected. Stood for the Shannon right afterwards, which is as grueling an experience as you can possibly imagine, and just about got elected. Then stood in a by-election in 2009 and didn't get elected, but then did get elected in 2011. So I stood for the door three times and got elected on my third occasion. Uh, uh, so uh, the kind of summary I offered earlier on of the challenges and demands that politics can bring, I certainly experienced in the early part uh, of trying to get into politics. And then when I did get elected in 2011, uh, uh, the constituency which I got elected to, which you've been good enough to arrange to look at its very finest just behind us here, uh, got completely redrawn and I had a, a, a really, really tough re-election challenge then in the election of that year. Dear. How do you deal personally then with, I'm not going to call it failure, I don't mean that in the sense of when you, when you get knocked back by the electorate, especially as you were starting off, is it something you just kind of dust yourself down with and say, so be it, or is it something that you take personally and then takes time to recover on that front? Oh, you take it personally uh, and to... to uh, to, to pretend otherwise and say that you can recover shortly afterwards. Uh, it just simply isn't the case. In politics, it's all in. Uh, and uh, when uh, that vote is cast on that ballot paper, it's not just against your name and face, it's against you. Uh, wherever I go in uh, fulfilling my uh, duties in politics, I always carry in my wallet the ballot paper from the last election that I stood in. Uh, because uh, the link between getting the consent and support of those who cast their vote, receiving it, and then fulfilling your, your duties is such an intrinsic and deep part of the social contract and of my life and of my, uh, the career I've pursued and the offices that I hold. And in those moments in which I wasn't successful in 07-09, uh, those early moments in my then re-election, the early moments of that day when it looked very likely I wouldn't get re-elected. Um, there is, they're, they're, they're hard tests and it uh, takes a while to get back on your feet. But the key thing is to get back on your feet. And the key thing is when you are uh, uh, knocked back, to think about why, and then to re-engage. Keep at it, keep going, never give in, never give up. That resilience again and that challenge to, to, to do it. You've been lucky, I suppose, maybe to serve, I think, under three Taoiseach over the yeah. last. Um, again, from a style view and a, and a, and a management bit of going into the, what, what is it you kind of see in the different styles of leadership that kind of appeals to you? And maybe what do you see sometimes under pressure, some of the traits that you kind of think, hopefully I don't kind of betray those traits when I'm under pressure? Well, without betraying any state Absolutely, secrets, yes. uh, uh, we talked a little bit about resilience and a little bit about how you manage setbacks and real tests. And the truth is, Nobody gets to be Taoiseach who doesn't have an innate ability to manage those moments. And all of the Taoiseach that I've worked for all had that quality. You don't get to be in that office. You don't get to hold that role in our constitution and in our country without having a level of resilience and stamina uh, that is of the very highest level. So uh, when I have worked for uh, Enda, Leo, and our current Taoiseach, uh, they have those qualities in spades. It's not to say they don't react in different ways. It's not to say they don't have their own ways of uh, responding and dealing with challenges. But fundamentally, the level of stamina and the temperament that is required to get to that office and then to hold it is of a uh, extraordinary nature. You've been in then the, the role of, of, of minister for a number of years now. How would you describe the difference between the role in the commercial world uh, and running a team and now running a team within the public service sector? Do you, do you need a different management style? Can you? There's a lot more overlap between uh, uh, the experience that I had in Procter & Gamble and then the experiences that I've had as a minister. But there wouldn't be a lot of overlap between my experiences in the private sector and being a TD. Uh, and the, uh, one of the needs that I think we have in public life is to try to have a, uh, a Doyle that is representative of all of the different elements of our economy and of our society. Uh, we know how important big employers are. 
in Ireland. We know how important the corporate sector, the FDI sector is to our economy. But we haven't had a whole lot of people in public life that have worked in it. And uh, I, I think it's really important that we do. And certainly when I began life as a minister, all of the experience that I had in Procter & Gamble and what I picked up along that way was massively, massively helpful. Now, it's not to say for a moment that you need to have the experience of running a large organisation and running a team of mm. people to then be able to mm. be a minister. Far from us. Um, some of the most effective people I've seen in political life and the most effective ministers and Taoiseach that I've seen had different paths to holding those offices to what I did. But I can simply say for me, in the journey I've had, it has really helped. So how do we attract then people from that commercial world? And it's all about balance and it's like any team, it has to come from a mix of backgrounds to get the best of the team. But how do we attract people from the commercial world? I mean, you had a, you've already expressed a huge passion to be in the public sector service and, and give back. What is it do you think we may need to do here to attract more people from that commercial world to having had a career in commercial? to consider politics maybe as an alternative. I think there's two things. The first one is those of us who are in public life and in politics should make the case for us as a craft and as a really enjoyable craft. And that's why, as you and I have chatted about it, I'm very open about acknowledging the challenges and tests that you do face. But it is incredibly rewarding and at many points uh, very, very enjoyable too. Uh, you uh, are tested in a way <clears throat> that little else in life can test you. Uh, and uh, my God, have I experienced that now over the last few years with where we've been with the pandemic and some moments before that. But nonetheless, as a, as a craft and as something to do in your life, it is immensely rewarding. But then the second thing is, and I think this is a responsibility that sets, sits with employers, is that if you have somebody who's working for you and they come to you and they say they want to be a councillor or they want to stand in the Senate or they want to try and become a TD, that it's not the end of the world. Mm. And you view that in the same way that you might view somebody who is trying to uh, go and uh, develop their education, uh, develop uh, their own personal development at a point in their lives. You view it in the same spirit. Uh, because ultimately, it is to the uh, long run benefit of all of us that we have a democracy uh, in which those who represent uh, reflect those they are representing. And employers have a role to play in that. And I would love to see a greater appreciation of that and an enablement of that by employers, particularly medium and large employers. Do you think there's a, an issue, and I don't know how you solve this issue, to do with some of the, I suppose, personal commentary that happens through social media against individuals where people might say, why would I get involved in politics? I, ha I might have a desire to, to be, uh, give public service, but just that element that has probably creeped in where, you know, and I know you, you've suffered from it along with a, a number of other ministers, that personal kind of um, attack that happens, it's not, it's not like it can be a safe place for employment. So uh, the personal nature of politics and the personalised nature of it is as age old as politics itself. And uh, it is the case that the format of us and the scale of us uh, has grown in recent years. And there are many things that have taken place in our media world, in our social media world, uh, that have played a role in it. But they in turn only reflect bigger things that have happened in our societies and our economies. Uh, but particularly the social media world has amplified that. That is, the, there's no doubt. So what would I say to somebody who is concerned about those risks uh, if they're considering a career in politics. The first thing to say is to be honest and say those risks are there. If you are in public life and uh, you make decisions, you're involved in decisions that you either get wrong or become highly contested, of course there are risks. They're clearly there for anybody who is interested in public life in the first place. But alongside that, I think two things really do matter. The first one is, is that at the end of the day, you're also making decisions that directly affect people's lives. And that is a great responsibility and a very solemn one. And with that responsibility do come consequences as well. And if you do want that responsibility and if you think you can do it well, and it's something you want to put your life against or put time against, then with that responsibility do come 
consequences do come things that can happen. But sometimes those consequences are uh, quite minor in comparison to the, what the consequences of the decision itself can be. So I think you have to see it all in the round. And then secondly, there are, are, are many ways of coping with and dealing with that level of um, personal challenge that can sometimes be there. Politics is not the only craft in the world that brings with it challenges in relation to you know, your well-being, how you feel about yourself, your health. Uh, so many other jobs, so many other roles have the same. And there are lots of things uh, that you can do personally to help manage a lot of that. Uh, uh, I feel the pressure. I read what people say about me. I'm well aware of the commentary about me in different ways. I have to make choices about how I manage all of that. And I think as we move into a world, a society, an economy in which the pandemic is not at the intense level that has been in the last couple of years, there is definitely a need for a broader debate regarding how in public life, words and commentary are more than just mediums. They change things themselves. Uh, but politicians have responsibilities too, and we have to be part of that discussion when it develops. Okay. So maybe moving on, um, they say politics is the art of the possible. And then within that, negotiation skills are, are hugely important. I mean, I touch on corporation tax in a minute. Do you think negotiation skills is something that is inherent in you? And okay, they develop over time, or is it something you can learn? It's something you can learn. Uh, it was a big part of my life before politics uh, because I was in the commercial arena uh, and uh, you know, very much involved in commercial decisions and representing my company to a whole variety of customers. And it is something that is absolutely um, uh, a skill that can be developed, something that is teachable. Uh, you do need to have uh, at the heart of it you know, some qualities that help with that but it is uh, a skill like any other. So in the recent negotiations around our corporation tax, I think no negotiation skills must have been at its very highest. Again, without giving away, how did you approach that just from a project viewpoint of you knew where I suppose the OECD wanted to get to, you were protecting, I suppose, both our national interest and the European situation with, with the role you hold there. So how did you navigate those? Well, it's a project that my department and I had been working on for, for nearly four years. And it's a project and an issue that I've been involved in uh, even beyond that. And uh, it would be difficult to underestimate just how much work and time we have put into it, uh, much of which has not been in the public eye. Uh, so we, for years, have been very clear on what our objectives have been at different points, seeking to redefine those objectives, uh, if needed, as the external, the global, the European environment may have changed, always demanding ourselves to think about what could be achievable, uh, and then also running through all of the different scenarios and trying to game them through and scenario plan. And there are things that were happening all of the time. Uh, we'll say though, you asked me a set of questions earlier on about you know, the team and the people you have working on it. And while I'm the public face of all of this and have been involved in it centrally from a political point of view, uh, we have an exceptional group of officials who have been working on this now for a number of years, exceptional, of the highest calibre. And they have played an instrumental role in representing Ireland on this issue, working our way through it and helping me make a set of very demanding and important choices. I would say we're by no means done yet. Mm -hmm. uh, we did definitely go through a really important juncture there last October uh, with the OECD framework. But as I said then, and I'll say now, there's lots of bridges ahead still. And it is a project that is far from complete. It's a process, it has some way to go. Uh, but from a advocacy and negotiation point of view, it was uh, a very big project. Is, is the negotiation style that you're probably more uh, associate with one of persuasion, working with trying to convert people to your point of view, or more, this is our position and we'll hold firm? A mix. Very much a mix. Uh, yes, advocacy, yes, persuasion, yes, trying to uh, convey and communicate to colleagues and to institutions uh, what your case is, making them see it from your eyes, 
but then accompanying that is utter clarity regarding what you will and will not do. What your bottom line is and you mm -hmm. won't go with them. Okay. Um, maybe then just in relation to moving on to, to hopefully coming towards the end of, of the pandemic or, or more no normality into to our environment. How have you experienced the, the remote working in the sense of, of being able to um, have the team around you? Was it a hybrid approach? What, was it because of the, the essential nature everybody was pretty much in? And what's your view maybe on hybrid working and what we gain and what maybe we lose um, in that? In so we did have a hybrid style of working and a hybrid format, but it was less hybrid uh, than would have been the norm uh, in our country, in our economy at different points. Uh, it was, you know, God knows we all now know how busy and how intense the last couple of years have been. Uh, but in my uh, department, it has been as, uh, as an intense uh, set of challenges as you can imagine. And we could do a lot of it hybrid, but we couldn't do all of it hybrid. And for many of the different moments that we had, I would have been in my office with a really small number of officials at all times adhering to our public health guidelines, but we did on a number of occasions just need to tease things out in person. Uh, and, and, we, and we would do that then while having other colleagues on the computer screen, on the monitor, on the phone, dialing in from their homes or maybe in another location in part of the building or in another building. Uh, so yeah, we learned the, uh, the upsides, the downsides of hybrid working across that period. Do you think it's changed for good in the sense of that we, you know, I know we, we talk about hybrid working and, but sometimes changes such as pandemic change everything and then things naturally go back to where they were? Or has this been a kind of watershed moment that there has been a fundamental change in how we will work going forward? So I've learned so much from the uh, awful demands of nearly the last two years. And one of the things I've definitely learned is beware of making definitive judgments at any point in time. Uh, and if you're going to make a definitive judgment, wait until uh, a, little bit of, a little bit of water has gone underneath the bridge. Uh, so I've got to be honest I, uh, on that then. I think it is a little too early uh, to form a view regarding how the hybrid nature of work is going to evolve. Uh, I believe there was a big pent-up demand from many people, particularly younger members of employers, to come back into the office. And that kind of view is vindicated a little bit when I'm coming around town now and around our city early in the morning. I see how busy our roads are and our paths are and our Lewis's and our buses are. So I, I think it is a little early to definitively call how it is going to change. That there will be change, I'm certain. That hybrid working could be the biggest and most permanent form of that change. I'm, I'm less clear. The, the message of history to us is, is, is really clear. It's unambiguous. Post-pandemic societies are different to the pre-pandemic world that they left. And that will be the mm. case with Ireland, with Europe and with the world again. And I think the way in which we work is going to be part of that. Uh, the digital nature and the productivity consequences of that think we might be underestimating. I suspect that could yet grow again. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I know that for many, they want to get to a place that it's sometime in the office, sometime at home. But where the pendulum is going to swing in that, in that, uh, in that continuum, uh, I'll be really interested to see. And as a government, what we just need to do is facilitate those kind of engagements with employers. Uh, and with those who work uh, in, for different companies, for different employers, and facilitate kind of a, a, a good discussion and engagement on that. So uh, on the digital versus old world, you're an avid book reader. Are you a digital or are you a hard paper? I am an avid uh, paper reader. Uh, uh, the book has to be in my hand uh, uh, but to know where I am when I pick it up. And I'm so traditional, I even have a bookmark. <laughs> um, you mentioned that you might be interested in going back to college yeah. when you fit. Where, where next for you, Minister, in the sense of is, do you see yourself in public service for your career? Do you see yourself going back into the commercial world? Or have you given that any thought? Uh, I've no plans beyond public service. Uh, I, I, with the 
uh, challenges and ups and downs in the last few few years. The last thing on my mind has been uh, where I'm going to be in a while uh, because we had so many challenges, but my plans are for public service and that's what I'm fully committed to. Uh, I, I, there's a few things in my life I, I love as much as uh, that I really, really love and really enjoy. And at a later point, there are things that I do want to definitely return to. Uh, but that's uh, many bridges ahead. Excellent. So maybe just finally on, on just looking at maybe the economic condition that the country is in, having um, some extremely strong ex exchequer re yeah. returns in, in, in the sense of the pandemic. What do you see the challenges in, at the start, start of 2022 now? What do you see the challenges for 2022? So uh, the, uh, as we think about what the challenges are, I think it's important to make the case for the challenges that we've also avoided uh, at this point. Uh, it, over the last uh, nearly two years, I've countlessly been asked about a couple of different things. Firstly, uh, is our economy going to face the challenge of mass unemployment? Uh, with countless employers being unviable and facing closure? And then at other points, it's going to be, are we facing the imminent return of austerity? Uh, at this point in time, at the end of January in 2022, we've successfully navigated our way through both those challenges. But that's not to underestimate some of the things that are on our agenda at the moment, but it is to make the case that at other points, other really big, even existential challenges faced us, and we've worked our way through them. So if I look at where we are at the moment, I think there is every prospect of our economy, from an income, from a jobs point of view, and also from the point of view of building homes, uh, moving into a period of really, really strong performance and delivery. Uh, but to use that dreaded phrase uh, that uh, forecasters, analysts and central banks are quite fond of when they say that risks are tilted to the downside, which always begs the question for me, are any risks ever tilted to the <laughs> upside? Uh, but to use that, of course, there are really clear threats and difficulties on the horizon. We're all aware of what they are. Uh, the, uh, what is happening beyond our shores, what could happen with regard to the security situation uh, in um, the uh, very east mm -hmm. of Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a, a gravely serious issue uh, that would have repercussions on many different levels for Ireland and for Europe. Uh, and then there are the more uh, familiar and expected challenges of where we are with the level of inflation that our economy is facing at the moment. And also with the challenge of, do we have enough people who have the right kind of skill to do the kind of work that our economy is now creating? So they are the return of some challenges that we have faced in our past. Uh, we are gonna knuckle down and deal with them. Uh, but let's also just remember that in January, 2021, we were facing uh, challenges that were of such a grave and such a pressing nature. And the fact that we can sit here this morning with a city mobile behind us with people coming into work, uh, with employers opening up safely again, able to re-employ of itself, is a, is a really important achievement that we've all made possible. Minister, it's been a great pleasure to listen to your views this morning. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you, and Michael. Very best. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.